Um, well, let me tell you a little bit about me. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Uh, you should always know who's talking at you anyway. And they should take their hat off so you can see whether or not they have hair. <laughs> um, I started my professional uh, career in Chicago. Um, I was fresh out of college. I wanted to be a reporter. I would go down to the city news bureau, which supplied reports of murders and uh, robberies to the various Chicago newspapers. And I would ask every week if there was a job for me, and they would say, no, uh, there isn't. Uh, and I supported myself by carrying furniture around in a van for people. And one day I carried a couch in, into the house of the uh, bureau chief of uh, the Chicago office of Variety. And he heard my story and liked me and he hired me because he had a kid who was leaving uh, the job and going out to Hollywood. And so I went from being a couch carrier to being uh, the reporter on duty in the Chicago Bureau of Variety and having and covering the Chicago Film Festival and having dinner with Roger Ebert all in the space of about 24 hours. Well, it turns out Roger lived down the street from me and so did Gene Siskel and they weren't really talking in those days and they're not here anymore sadly to talk, but uh, they weren't the friends. I could be friends with one or the other, but never both at the same time. And we went to movies, we had a great time. And I sort of became involved because Variety, I don't know if you, how many of you know uh, Variety, it's a trade paper um, along with The Hollywood Reporter. <clears throat> and in its heyday, it really was a very hard-nosed news in, uh, newspaper about the motion picture business, the trade of, of the business. It really was far less interested in who was sleeping with who and what star was making what film. It was based on results and not based on projected uh, film deals. And so as a result, since I was in Chicago, um, there wasn't really any production to speak of. Uh, all there was was exhibition, so I be began talking to exhibitors, uh, the guys who own theaters. And they were sort of the, the fly on the ass of the elephant, um, basically. Nobody wanted to talk to an exhibitor uh, because they didn't get anything done. All they did was open up the theater and turn on the lights and show the movie and sell the popcorn and make the money off the popcorn. And what I discovered was, in fact, that there was a whole world of sales practices that were going on in the 1970s um, that were um, below the radar, weren't visible to uh, the rest of the, the world, and which were quite fascinating. Um, and they were fascinating because they flew in the face of a, uh, the history of the motion picture business that had grown up over the previous 50, 60, 70 years. Let's go back and flash on that for a moment. Um, the motion picture business came from Nickelodeons. The new technology of cameras and films and stuff and stories was um, something that took place around the turn of the 20th century. And the people who got into it were people who had nothing much else to do. They were scrap merchants or tailors or whatever. In short, they, it was, since it was a new industry, they tended to be minorities, they tended to be heavily Jewish because the, the banks and the insurance companies um, and the landed sort of comp corporations of the day weren't really employing, you know, people who weren't white Anglo-Saxon Protestant men. And so there was this burgeoning new technology that was happening that um, anybody could participate in. So the Warner Brothers grew up in, I think, uh, Beaver something, Pennsylvania, and they had a Nickelodeon and they made a bunch of money um, with their Nickelodeons, and they decided to go out to Hollywood. Because the task ultimately, you know, in starting a studio was to get more pictures 
to supply the Nickelodeons first and then later the movie theaters. The way the business grew was we grew studios in order to supply the theaters where the money was. That, of course, turned on its head and when we had you know, the heyday of the Hollywood studio becoming a star making machine, becoming a marketing machine, becoming an exhibition machine, because all these studios owned their own theaters, which created a habit of production for them because they owned, stu they owned theaters, now they had to keep on producing stuff, and there was nowhere else to go for people to get entertainment. My mom, who grew up on Lexington and 115th Street in New York, would go to the movies all day for a quarter. Uh, everybody went to the movies. They went to the movies every week. That's what people did, because that's all there was to do. Um, <clears throat> and the high point of this movie-going habit was 1946, just after all the soldiers came home from World War II. There were more admissions in 1946 than in any historical year afterwards. More money has been made, but that's due to inflation. But the high point of attendance of hundreds of millions of people going to the movies every week was in 1946. And after that, it started to retreat. And it really started to retreat uh, about the time I'm a little kid and television comes in. Because now, people can stay home and watch TV. There may only be one channel if they you know, live in Kalispell, Montana. There may be five channels in New York City. There may be three in Toledo, Ohio, where I was, uh, which represented the programming choices of the three networks, NBC, ABC, and CBS. But that's what you did. Um, that wreaked havoc with motion pictures. People could stay home and watch something. It might be stupid. It might be Leave it to Beaver. But they weren't going to movies. Um, and that completely threw the industry into um, a kind of a turmoil about how to reach uh, new audiences. And it happened at the same time that something else happened um, during the, uh, from 1938 to 1948. This is a little, little uh, complex, but I'll do it as quickly as I can. Since the studios owned um, the means of production was, the, you know, all the, the, the production uh, houses had uh, their own sort of, of ways of making movies, and they distributed, them, distributed the movies that they owned through all the various branches. Um, they distributed them to, essentially, to theaters that they owned. So if you think of it as a supply chain, it starts, it's almost Marxian. You know, it starts with the means of production, ends up with um, the production itself, and, and follows through with the liquidation of the product to company-owned stores. That's what's called vertical integration. It's in a seamless business that's all vertically integrated. Now, if you want to be in the movie business and you own a theater and you're in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and you don't own a theater that is owned by the studios, they don't necessarily feel the need to sell to you. In addition to which, you have to understand the climate of what was going on in the 1930s politically. Um, <clears throat> politically, uh, people there was a great sort of religious uh, revival in the heartland. They were concerned about godless Hollywood. People in Hollywood were, you know, uh, partying. You guys ever go to parties? You know nothing about what was going on in parties. Um, and uh, this engendered a kind of a moral backlash about the godless people in Hollywood who were poisoning our minds, who were making pictures about being fair and socialists and all kinds of stuff. And there was a movement afoot that started in the Midwest in the 1930s to get Hollywood out of the controls of the Jewish film industry. And so they lobbied their congressman, and the congressman lobbied the Justice Department. And the Justice Department said, well, we'll look into this vertical integration business. And so they began a suit in 1938 against Paramount Pictures and five other companies uh, which dominated the time. And you know their names. MGM uh, was one. 20th Century Fox was another one. Uh, Warner Brothers and RKO Brothers Theaters. 
uh, which also had a studio that produced for themselves. And that litigation got stalled over the war years. Um, <clears throat> it stopped in its tracks because everything stopped in the uh, during the war. But then when the war was over in 45, and business got back to normal, and they had this terrific production year in 1946, the litigation got picked up again. And um, the Justice Department, uh, now the Truman Justice Department, essentially reached a settlement with the five companies known as the Paramount Decrees, in which they forced the film companies to get rid of their theaters. They could be in the production business, and they could be in the distribution business, but they couldn't sell to their own theaters. Theaters now were to be spun off and operate as independent companies. And the theory behind that was that uh, that would allow more people to have movie theaters um, they could compete for, uh, uh, to show movie theaters, it would spur production to produce to independent movie theaters, and they, and the hope was by the people who started this suit back in the 30s that it would produce more wholesome Christian-oriented production that would make, have proper values instead of improper values. That didn't happen. It never happened. But that's the, was the, the impetus behind um, the, the breaking up of that business. And so what happened was, when the studios now suddenly, you know, crying and yelling and screaming about the government being involved in their business and breaking them apart, suddenly didn't have theaters. Think of theaters as hungry, hungry babies. Didn't have to feed any hungry babies anymore. It's like, guy, good riddance. We don't have to deal with you people. They no longer had to make movies the way they had to make movies in the past. They didn't have anybody demanding them. So they went into the television business. And if they stayed in the movie business, they made fewer movies. That, uh, to, in a, to make a long story short, and in a nutshell, didn't exactly entirely work because people liked staying home so much they decided they didn't want to go see you know, the movies that Hollywood was making in Hollywood got desperate. They started making uh, big uh, screen epics. All of the biblical epics of Moses and Ben-Hur, which did work, um, uh, all these sort of efforts to lure people back to the movies, which were called sword and sorcery or toga movies or whatever have you, were also put on wide screens. Hollywood invented you know, a wider screen called Panavision, or, or Fox had another one where they blew the sides out of the screen, and the aspect ratio went from essentially the standard classic model, which was 166 to 1, which was a, a almost square, but not exactly. Um, it blew the sides of the screen out so that they could have these big epics, and you could sweep across huge battlefields of people lying around in pools of blood, you know, um, and to bring people back to the movies. And eventually, this was a sort of a self-defeating prophecy because the, the template got old, the pictures got old, people didn't want to go see this stuff anymore, and they were perfectly at happy laying at home on the couch watching something on TV. Okay, so... Um, I come into the picture in the late 70s, and I see that Hollywood is essentially um, uh, uh, selling movies to uh, in, a re in a reduced capacity. They ha have discovered the blockbuster along with Love Story and The Godfather. Uh, in Paramount, discovered you know that you could bring huge audiences to theaters if you had one particular property that people wanted to see. They'd come and see that one, but they wouldn't see the other stuff. Um, I'll give you the, the funniest case in point about that was Star Wars in 1977. When I was going to, when I was your age, going to films, we saw all sorts of movies that featured antiheroes: uh, Midnight Cowboy, um, uh, uh, The Godfather, in its way, uh, being about a mafia family, um, McCabe and Mrs. Miller. All these antiquated, quaint sort of pictures. Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid was a a kind of a Hollywood version of the the the, the anti-hero. There were all the small Cassavetes films about you know sort of people who were um, uh, characters in in difficult circumstances and, and dramas. 
Well, people got sick of the anti-hero after a while, and they wanted something different, but nobody really understood that till Star Wars came along, least of which was Fox. Uh, it was a Fox picture, and they thought that they had a great big uh, movie that year to release called The Other Side of Midnight. It was done by Sidney Sheldon. And so they sold... Uh, Sydney Sheldon to movie theaters as well. If you want to take, if you want Sydney Sheldon's The Other Side of Midnight, which was hot, steamy sex with you know women with bursting out of their dresses and handsome hunky guys, and I don't even remember who was in it. You have to Google it real quick to see who was in it. But it was whoever the leading you know sort of trashy stars were at the time. If you want The Other Side of Midnight for your theater. Uh, we're not going to say this overtly because the Justice Department will get very angry at us if we say it, but let's just leave it as a conversation between you and our branch sales manager that you have to take this other little stupid picture that we got, some space picture about a guy, you know, OB some, I don't know, um, and then we'll sell it to you. So, of course, that's how Star Wars got sold to theaters. And when Star, when the other side of Midnight opened up, it promptly dropped dead because nobody wanted to see that. And Star Wars took off because everybody wanted to see pictures in space. They were tired of people wearing old crummy cowboy clothes and being chased by, you know, federal troops across dusty deserts. They wanted to see clean white, you know, refrigerator armies running through halls, you know, chasing, you know, the good guy. Um, who was trying to restore the honor of the empire. And it was this enormous, you know, uh, breath of fresh air in terms of the aesthetics. Even as tired as it may seem to s some of you now, uh, and it does to me, uh, at the time it was an aesthetic revolution because it also, it, it inculcated the, the different direction that people wanted to go in, in socially, politically, aesthetically, everything. And yet it was sold in an anti-competitive fashion, which did get the, the attention of the Justice Department, which did find 20th Century Fox a slap on the wrist uh, and told them they couldn't behave like that anymore. And as a result, what happened um, after that was Ronald Reagan became elect, got elected president, which people said you could see that happening if you looked at Star Wars and understood that there was a kind of a, um, an, uh, a reassertion of American pride in Star Wars, of its military, of its technical capabilities, and all that stuff. You could see that Reagan was going to sweep out, you know, the old and bring in, you know, the new at the time. And as a result of that, um, you have to understand who Ronald Reagan was. He was, was. he was a lousy actor. Um, he was always the guy who didn't get the girl. He was the, 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 the character actor. He had a couple of good movies where he did carry uh, major roles. But by and large, his career had failed by the 1950s. And he was, he, his agent was a guy named Lou Wasserman who got him on television doing a program called Death Valley Days. And he would come out and he would be his Reagan wooden self and he would tell some, he would introduce a story about Death Valley Days, all of which involved people dying mysterious deaths uh, or surviving in the desert, probably filmed somewhere out here, you know. And that was how Ronald Reagan survived the 1950s um, uh, in terms of his career. <clears throat> Lou Wasserman, you know, became head of Universal, uh, which was a signat not a signatory, but behaved according to the rules of the antitrust agreement reached in 1948. And when Reagan was president, he instructed his Justice Department, stop enforcing these consent decrees. If they want to own theaters, let them own theaters. If they want to sell things, you know, in packages of pictures, let them sell things in terms of packages of pictures. If they don't want to sell each picture, picture by picture, theater by theater, solely on the merits, which was the criterion of selling um, films uh, in a supposedly regulated, fair environment so that everybody could be a participant, we might have wholesome, you know, entertainment again, you know, then, you don't have to do it anymore. Game over. And so we got the modern film industry, which itself got blindsided by where we are now. Because where we are now is something that is, in fact, near and dear to your hearts. Um, how many of you have Netflix accounts? Uh-oh. How many of you have Amazon accounts? Okay. Uh-oh. Um, so that's where we are now. And where we are now is this huge paradigm shift that's taken place um, in the film industry once again. And it's hard to say 
that this isn't a good thing. Um, I, um, uh, in my various capacities that uh, I said I would get to, and I sort of got uh, latered, um, I do do film reviews on a radio station in New York called WBGO, which is a jazz station uh, that has NPR news and formats. I did edit the magazine Film Comment. Has anybody ever heard of Film Comment? A couple of people. It's an artsy-fartsy magazine, comes out of Lincoln Center and the Film Society of Lincoln Center, which is the New York Film Festival. Um, it would get me um, a, a table uh, at the Berlin Film Festival. They'd say, oh, you edit Film Comment, well, ho, ho. You know, whereas uh, I once found a guy selling film comments on the streets of New York um, all with his other reused magazine, uh, used magazines, which included titles that I will not mention here. Um, but it's an august position to have had for a period of time. I did cover Cannes and Sundance and Berlin and other places for USA Today for 20 years. So all of the folks who run in those circles are aghast by the arrival of Netflix and decry the lack of theater-going uh, habits of all of you young folks, some of whom I own uh, sort of as my children, and, um, who, one of whom is a production manager and makes movies, uh, one of whom is a ski bum and uh, goes to movies in Telluride because that's where she's a ski instructor, and et cetera, and one of whom is in graduate school uh, at 22 in social work in New York and couldn't care less about movies and only watches junk on the streaming services and not even good stuff. I can't even get her to watch the good stuff on the streaming services. She's watching reruns of Grey's Anatomy. <clears throat> and yet there's all this wonderful stuff. Uh, I believe, actually, that the net positives of Netflix uh, and Amazon, etc., are in exchange for what may be a, a decrease in the availability of the theatrical experience, which is nice, is the increase in the availability not only of films that heretofore were not available in Kalispell, Montana, or to some guy sitting in a yurt in the Ural Mountains, you know, who now can tune in and see stuff that they couldn't see, and which was the experience of everywhere all around the world, including America, that you'd read about the things that won the Cannes Film Festival and nobody could see them. Well, now you can see them, actually. Um, they're available. Now Parasite is nominated, <clears throat> which won the... Cannes Film Festival, has a distribution deal. I'm compressing a lot of film history here, um, and I'll go back over it in a moment when we, after we open things up. Um, those things are available to be seen, and because they're available to be seen, there is this in, um, a geometric explosion of production. <clears throat> How Even you must have the experience of, you know, People saying, have you seen such and such a, 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 a film or series on television that you've never heard of? And you say, oh, gee, I better catch up to that. Because there's so much good stuff that's being produced. You know, I just stumbled into Fleabag. I stumbled into Fleabag the night before, you know, the woman who's the lead actress was winning all the awards. I, you know, you get older, you're a little late to catch on to stuff. Um, but there's this explosion of production. There's an, an, an absolute unbelievable outreach of this stuff. Film critics will tell you that this is bad because they don't have the common ex shared experience of watching a film in the dark. That's true, except that where it's headed, uh, it, there is a, a room for that. And there's a way, there's a reason for why there's room, going to be room for that. But it's just going to be changed. It's going to be a different kind of, of availability of the theatrical experience. Um, and um, the, the ways in which you watch things at home may not be the same as the way, you wish, the way in which you watch things in theaters. We all know that if you watch something at home, there is the pee break, there is the popcorn break, there is the ice cream break, there is the doorbell break, there is the phone break, there is the fact that you fell asleep on the couch break, um, and all those other breaks. But in addition to which, some people will tell you that um, watching things in a, 
at home, you sort of lean back and say, okay, come to me. Whereas watching things in the theater, you kind of lean forward that edge of your seat if all things go well in a movie theater experience where you make a more active investment in watching what's taking place on the screen than if you're leaning back at home saying, yeah, what do you got? Um, <clears throat> maybe, maybe not. But that's where you are. You're poised on that kind of a paradigm shift now uh, in which there's a lot more production, there's a lot more ability for a lot more people to see stuff, um, and you can figure out if that's how you want to fit into that, if that's what you want to do in terms of getting involved in the business. I think that that's the broad out outlines, the broad contours of where I think we are. It's built on a, in a previous paradigm shift that happened when film went to television, um, when the legal structure uh, hastened that breakup of the, the power of the film studios, just as Netflix is changing the way in which uh, the power of the film producing entities is, is changing and shifting um, now. So I want to stop there and open this up to both Kevin uh, and you for your comments and or questions. First, let's open it up to everybody for uh, an answer question. Who has a question? Who has a question? Yeah. So you said that there was going to be a, a time and place for the theatrical experience. Where do you see that developing in the next decade? Question follows up on, on my... Uh, question. I'm going to... The question follows up on my a statement that there will be a time and place for theatrical exhibition. Um, how do I see that developing? When I was at Variety um, covering exhibition in the, the 70s, um, you could see that film companies were no longer really all that interested in spending money to create motion picture prints so that a film could go to second and third run. And I wrote that in 10 years, first run exhibition would be the only thing that would be left and it would cost 10 bucks a, a, a admission. And there was a very nice man who was the head of marketing at Lowe's Theaters who called me up and said, uh, I'll bet you that 10 bucks now and lunch that you're wrong. Um, and we made the bet and of course, it didn't happen by the 1980s that that had happened, but that was essentially what my view was. And that's essentially what it is now, even though I'm you know, many years late in making that observation. What you're seeing is the gradual dropping off of secondary and sub-run you know, motion picture um, uh, chains in theaters. You're even seeing the dropping off of the independent art house uh, chains although they cater to a different level of product and a different audience um, than the majors do. The, one of the mo most robust and healthy audiences are the older audience, because they don't know any better. They still go to theaters. They'll be told, you know, you tell them how to work the Netflix, Netflix or Netflix or, you know, Google machine, they don't, you know, they call up their kid and say, Jeremy, how do I work the Google machine? You know, um, <clears throat> we can't get there. Believe me, I've done it, so I know. Um, <clears throat> that audience wants a different kind of product, if that's what we're talking about here, and they want the old experience. So they will go to Harkins and Camel View um, because that is what they know and it's familiar. But guess what? That audience isn't going to be around for a whole lot longer. Um, so if you were an investor and putting money into the art house scene, you might be making a good move because there might always be that niche audience of, at some level, um, but the dominant audience is moving to a different kind of, of experience. Um, Netflix really puts the, the gun to everybody's head and says, well, you know, why, if you can see something that's wonderful, why, you know, uh, we can acquire it uh, for you and show it to you, or we can um, do original productions that change the form of entertainment itself. It doesn't have to be a 90-minute or a two-hour movie. It can now be a 60-hour movie spread out over eight seasons. Um, artists like doing that. So the theory is 
that what happens out of all of this is that some level of premium first-run exhibition remains because there is, in fact, the need to go out to theaters. People do want to get, you know, up from the couch, put on their pants or their dress, you know, and leave the house and go see other people and sit in the dark and watch a movie, and they're willing to pay a premium experience for that, particularly if you give them a nice chair. Right? And if you do something else, which is you turn up the bulb so that the actual image makes it to the screen in all its beauty and intensity and prettiness, which a lot of um, major chains don't do. They give you a substandard performance. Hence that argument, I don't know if you followed it in the trades in which uh, Marty Scorsese says the majors are making junk. Um, and Edward, uh, what's his name? Edward Norton, thank you very much, says, yeah, the reason people don't want to go to movie theaters is that they're turning, they turn the bulbs down in order to save on not having to change the bulbs. And you can, you have a picture that gets filmed in the tropics and it looks like it was made in a mud, you know, flat somewhere. So, <clears throat> so that experience of the first run premium exhibition um, is something that will be retained and uh, uh, as the rest of the sort of penetration of the marketplace grows exponentially by being able to stream it to people on their devices, hopefully not their watches, on their you know big screen televisions at home and stuff like that. Part of what's hastening this, or not hastening, which is slowing down this distribution model, is the Oscars and the Cannes Film Festival because they have dug in their heels and said, <clears throat> unless you show in a theater, you're not a movie. Um, so we're not going to include you in our nomination process for uh, the Oscars. We're not going to include you in our festival to be eligible to win the Palme d'Or if you don't show in a movie theater. So two years ago, there was a huge fight at the Cannes Film Festival in which Netflix wanted to had a whole slate of five films, including the new restored copy of The Other Side of the Wind, the late Orson Welles' unfinished uh, film, uh, which Netflix invested in after 40 years in which nobody would make that investment. Um, uh, and they'd restored it uh, with the help of a lot of artists. And they were going to show it at the Cannes Film Festival, but Cannes said, you have to open all these things in theaters. And they said, well, that's not our distribution plan. And they said, well, if that's not your distribution plan, I don't know what to tell you. You can't show here. So Netflix pulled all, of, all five of its films, including Roma and all kinds of stuff that was supposed to be there. The result is, is that Netflix has suddenly understood that if they want to play the ball game, Things are moving slower than they'd like to move it, and they've gone into the business of taking leases on long-term theaters in certain key markets. The Paris Theater, which is beloved in New York City for its long tradition of showing French films and other foreign films in New York City, uh, lost its lease to uh, increasingly a phenomenon that's happening in New York and other cities where the real estate value has become so high the underlying businesses that are leaseholders can't afford to function. That includes theaters first and foremost, and they go out of business. So what Netflix did was when the Paris could no longer function to afford to function as a movie theater, Netflix, which seemingly because of the amount of revenues that's coming in by subscription every month, can afford to do anything, um, took over the lease uh, because it's now in their interest to say to the academy, well, you see, we've um, responded to your rules change that a film has to show in theaters for eight weeks prior to you know, being considered for an Oscar. We now own and operate the Paris Theater. They're gonna do, I think they have one in LA coming up. They're gonna do it in four or five theaters around the country in order to be able to do that. And that's in order to be able to qualify for the Oscars which you may have noticed, they figure very prominently in this Oscar nominating season. Suddenly, there are all sorts of Netflix pictures from the two popes, to you name it, that are, have managed to figure into the, the, the nomination process. So we're looking at a period 
in which exhibition gradually starts pulling uh, it in its horns because the economics don't favor going to the local AMC out here in you know wherever um, because that experience can be delivered to your home. Um, but the, the desire to go see a first-run movie by a first-run producer still survives. That's the basically the model that we're going to. And that's happening. That would happen tomorrow if, if Netflix thought that they could get away with it. But there's a certain amount of resistance, um, not only by the official bodies uh, like the Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences, and some of the film festivals like Cannes, but also my profession, the press, is wedded to the notion that the only movie worth seeing is a movie on a big screen in a dark theater with other people. Um, and people lament um, the passing of that experience. I've grown up in it, I loved it, I like it, I, I'm addicted to it, but I really do like the fact that there's somebody out in, in Butte that can now see Parasite that not in a million years would have been able to see it before. The trade-offs to me are worth it. Yes, sir. With the events in uh, things like uh, IMAX theaters, um, virtual reality. Do you see that being something that would expand and actually bring that theater audience back? The question is about the well, the technological advance that we seem to be on the precipice of, um, such as virtual reality, uh, bring audiences back. Well, it's interesting that you say that because a couple, two, three years ago at the Cannes Film Festival, they had a um, an installation that they put out into an, uh, the Can Air, uh, an airport hangar at Cannes that was done by Alfredo Alberto Gonzalez Inuritu. Um, and it was, a, I don't know if, I forgot what the name of it was, but it was something, Flesh and Sand. Flesh and Sand. Uh, flesh and Sand, thank you. Um, and so it was a great big uh, airplane hangar like this with a dirt floor, and they made you take off your shoes and stuff, and they put a VR helmet on your head, uh, and then they trailed you around so that when you bumped into the wall, you know, you wouldn't end up being a lawsuit. Um, <clears throat> And what it did is it propelled you into the border down here, you know, just south of Tucson. And you're in the dark, and all of a sudden you are aware of a group of migrant um, emigres coming, uh, crossing the border illegally. And there's an old man, and there are a couple kids, and somebody's leading a pack horse, and somebody has their grandma, and the uh, little girl is leading her grandma, and she says, Grandma, I'm hungry, and her grandma says, uh, you know, Carmelita, don't worry, we will be, we will see Jose soon, etc. And you're really sort of watching, you are there watching this when all of a sudden, wham, a helicopter drops down from out of the sky and scares the pee down your leg. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and all and the federales are everywhere within a minute, and you're scared, and they turn to you at some point and train a gun at you and say, down on the ground, down on the ground. So Inurito successfully took and did what movies do. It's a voyeuristic medium. Any movie worth its salt has always been about letting you into a, a room that you couldn't get to in on your own and eavesdrop. That's what we do um, as voyeurs. That's why film critics, by the way, are professionally very weird people because we'd rather sit alone in a room in the dark, you know, and spy on other people than actually have to do things like relate or feed the dog or have, you know, normal human relations. Um, <clears throat> uh, this thing was astonishing. And the question then arose out of that, well, what happens when we can import some part of that into your living room as a holographic experience? What happens to narrative when, does narrative end up getting reshaped by the technological innovation that we're on the precipice of? What happens when it can involve you in the middle of the action? Um, all of those questions remain uh, uh, sort of um, unanswered at the moment. Uh, it will certainly bring people back into um, a, a VR emporium is a possibility, you know, that if you were going to invest your money instead of in, in a sub-run, you know, <clears throat> AMC house, you might want to think about 
Do you want to be involved in setting up VR emporiums around the country so that people could go have this interactive, you know, narrative experience that has fictional characters and whose outcomes are unclear, who may travel a traditional Aristotelian arc of, you know, climax um, or anticlimax, climax, etc., or which might involve your participation in whether they live or die? I don't think we know the answer to that. If I were to bet, I would bet that there are some enduring uh, verities in the world, which is that people like um, the narrative arc that we travel. We like seeing characters that we get to know. We like some of them being hateful. We like them being contextualized as to why they're hateful. We like beating them. Uh, we like a climactic moment in which um, the lovers, you know, go off into the sunset or, you know, die tragically or whatever it is, that those things will remain as staples of our uh, need for entertainment and for working through, you know, our own sort of fantasies as well as problems. Um, but how that technology ends up delivering that experience and where, I think <clears throat> smarter people than I are working on that, you know, as we speak. And I do think that in the next 10 years, there will be uh, <clears throat> VR auditoriums. I don't know what, whether or not, how, is the application of having a holographic, you know, knight errant like Lancelot in your living room while you're in your underpants, uh, is that gonna work? Is that gonna happen? I don't know why not, but I don't know what the plans are for that. You can get somebody in here from a Hollywood production company, because I cannot believe that Disney isn't thinking about it. Got to be. It's where the money's going to be. Yes, this gentleman. Um, you're talking about uh, Star Wars and how at that period the, the uh, aesthetic that the society wanted, uh, we're not society, but America wanted at that point. Do you think that there's an aesthetic that like, is predictable at this time, or is the aesthetic that we use That's a really good question. The, the question um, picked up off of my statement that um, the sort of collective unconscious of 1977 was ready for an aesthetic revolution like Star Wars. And is there something like that um, that is observable uh, now? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, there are times when I have thought that I know, knew the answer to that. Um, but I'm not entirely sure that I know um, what the, the answer to that is. Uh, I think that I, there's a certain level of fatigue with these big tentpole, you know, sort of franchise comic book characters. Nevertheless, one comes along every so often and makes $400 million in an opening weekend. So. It sort of says that, yeah, you may think that way, but there's an awful lot of people who don't think that way. But I also think that there's a certain degree to which uh, people are looking for certain kinds of uh, relatable um, characters that are more merely grappling with things that are familiar to them. I don't know how to explain <clears throat> the phenomenon of Parasite doing as well as it did. How many of you have seen Parasite? A whole bunch of you. I am not a big fan of Parasite, um, which is odd because it's, I've, there are lots of movies that have won the Cannes Film Festival that I have been a fan of, I, Daniel Blake, that nobody ever saw. Um, the reason I, I'm not crazy about it is because it does something that I didn't quite understand. It says I'm a metaphor about class, you know, the, the haves and the have-nots. And then we move into a central in, in section in which, oh, the f previous, you know, s servants are down in the basement. So we go down into the basement and there's a whole bunch of weird shit going on down in the basement. <laughs> okay? What? Uh, no spoilers. And then we move to the 
uh, the garden party at the end, and then, you know, that turns into a different kind of movie altogether. That, to me, just is a movie that lacks tone and lacks a coherent vision. <clears throat> and in fact, if it was about a metaphor, the metaphor that it was described as, which is about the haves and the have-nots, wasn't complete enough. It actually is a probably pretty good metaphor for the South Korean mentality, which says, you know, we could have a wave of North Koreans coming in and inv invading our wealthy, you know, uh, life of privilege. And, um, and that's the thing that scares us. More than Kim Jong-un nuking us is that everybody gets fed up one day and sort of infiltrates over the border and ends up, you know, taking stuff away. That works for me. That, that film, but that's not the film that is described by most of the people that they see because they see it in a Western context rather than in a Korean context. Nevertheless, what has been astonishing is that that film was marketed by a small independent company, Neon, which had luck with a film that I loved called I, Tanya. How many of you saw that? That was cool. Um, <clears throat> has struck gold with this film, the same way A24 did with Moonlight a few years ago, which won the Oscar in that infamous moment when the Oscar was awarded to La La Land and then retracted and given to Moonlight. Well, these small little independent companies, which is the part of the discussion that we didn't have about uh, the business that um, involved the Oscars and the studios, etc. Those companies are an outgrowth of companies that started in the 1970s. Uh, Cinema 5, which showed movies in New York, uh, the Rugoff Theaters, Janus Films, the New Yorker Theater, later retooled um, and reinvented as Weinstein, whose name, Tui Tui, you can't mention anymore, came with Miramax um, and uh, uh, the Weinstein Company, all of which essentially replicated a function that the major studios used to do, which was they used to produce pictures that were meant to win Oscars so that they could produce junk which paid the bills. So United Artists, <clears throat> which made all kinds of money off the Bond franchise, also would produce One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest by Ken Kesey, you know, which was a picture that they could look at themselves in the mirror and say, I did that. And that was the that was the way in which the business had sort of been integrated. We made one for the art, we made five for the business. <clears throat> when the business got split up, and the Hollywood studios could only produce junk, <clears throat> suddenly all these little companies, like the Weinstein Company with the crying game, et cetera, were winning Oscars. That wasn't part of the plan, and so they ended up buying all the small companies. Disney bought Miramax. Uh, <clears throat> Miramax then split up, and Weinstein went out on his own. We all know that that's a separate problem, you know, the Weinstein problem, but that's where the impulse came to make quality pictures was in the smaller companies. And now you get these small companies and they go to the Oscars and they eat the studio's lunch. Because Parasite is a metaphor that addresses, you know, what people think is a metaphor that addresses class and it means something to them. They see Netflix do the two popes and it's a discussion about the future of the Catholic Church. Well, that's different than Star Wars. There's more in it for people in Star Wars. And so if you ask me uh, where I think we are in terms of this, an aesthetic shift, I'm not sure. But in terms of the divide between entertainment that has substance and entertainment that is um, comic book oriented, I would say to you that a film like Joker, um, which gets split off from its DC comic roots, to become an art house film and make an art house statement about the coming sort of working class revolution in which they finally all get mad at being, you know, crapped on, you know, and take matters into their own hands. That's where we are at the moment, is there's that kind of a division between quality, um, you know, sort of art house uh, characters dealing with big themes big themes um, versus the junk 
that the studios continue to make that nobody seems to be all that much interested in. If you could name one film that is your favorite that you would always say everybody should see, what would it be? <laughs> I would say you should see William Wyler's 1957 uh, Friendly Persuasion with Gary Cooper and Dorothy Malone. That film always makes me cry. Anytime I turn it on and it's on Turner Classics Movies, if I've woken up on the couch and it's two in the morning and I say I gotta go to bed because the next morning I gotta go to WVGO and write, read you know, my review about movies, uh, it keeps me up till 4.30 and then I am thick-headed and brain dead um, because it is the perfect vision of family to me. And none of you, how many, is, is there one person here who has seen Friendly Persuasion? I got one. I got you know one live one and the professor. Um, you're in, what can I tell you? It's a wonderful film. It's it's the way in which I wish life was. Well, thank you very much. That's <laughs>